now's the time to tell them, hey, jump over to Dr. Barry's page and watch this because we're going to talk about some stuff. Hey, doctor. What's up, brother? Man, I have been busy today. How about you? You know what? I've had, I had the day off, so I had the exact opposite oh. day of you. No, I've been jacked up busy at the clinic, and I thought I had time to get home, and I almost wound up being late as it was. Let me get all my stuff situated here. Okay. Hey, man. How's it going? Good to see good. you. Good. How are you? Good to see you, oh, too. Oh, man. Busy, but good. We're running and gunning, but, but having a good time. So I'm going to give everybody a minute to jump on. If you're watching this on the replay, make sure and leave your questions in the comments. Dr. D and I will we'll, we'll come back and, and check this for comments every few days, and we'll try to answer all your questions. Um, we're probably going to have a few hundred watching, Doc, and so let me give everybody a moment to jump on. And you know, while we're doing that, for everybody who's watching on the replay, I want you to go ahead and, and give us your introduction. Tell us who you are and why we should care what you say. Yeah, well, basically, I mean, if I'm doing a Facebook Live with you right away, it doesn't matter who I am, right? We should all care about <laughs> what's, what we're talking about. But basically, I'm a doctor of pharmacy as well as a cardiovascular research scientist. So I've been publishing on nutrition for nearly a decade. I've written two books, The Salt Fix and Super Fuel, which is coming out in a month. And really, um, you know, I've been passionate about nutrition, micronutrients, um, publishing evidence-based uh, nutrition. And so, uh, you know, uh, been published over a couple hundred papers in the medical literature. So that's kind of what I do. Which is very impressive, guys. You may or may not know this, but uh, being published a few times is pretty impressive. I've been published in, in uh, peer-reviewed journals exactly zero times. And so I'm, I'm, I have great awe and respect for Dr. D. Nick Antonio because of that. I mean, you, you don't just do that. You don't trip and fall and get a, a peer reviewed published paper. You have to work for that. And so tell us where you're working at now, what you're working on, and then we're going to, we're going to start with salt and then we'll wind up with fat. How's that sound? Sounds great. Okay. Yeah. So my, yeah. So um, basically, uh, you know, my research is out of the preventive cardiology department at St. Luke's Mid-America Heart Institute. And then currently, I actually just wrapped up my, my third book with Dr. Fung called The Longevity Solution. So ah, nice. we're pumped about that. Absolutely. So that's going to be coming out in a few months, I would guess. Uh, May, actually. In May. Beautiful. Yep. I love it. And so your first book, The Salt Fix, I've recommended to all of my listeners at least 500 times. Uh, basically, every time somebody says, yeah, but what about salt? I just drop a link to your book because I think it's by far the most comprehensive and the most um, easy to understand treatise on salt that's ever been written in the history of humanity. And I'm not joking. I'm, I'm dead serious about that. There, have been, there are people who have written about salt in the past and, and done kind of half-assed jobs, but I feel like you really just tied everything up and put a, put a big, fat, pretty bow on top. And so let's dive into salt. And I'm going to be watching the comments for questions, guys. So I may not get to your question right off the bat, but I'm going to try to keep a kind of a running tally of what the questions are so we can get as many questions answered by the good doctor as possible. So salt. Everybody, hey, Ben Fury, everybody knows that salt is bad for you and that you should really try to strictly limit your salt intake so that you don't have a heart attack and you don't have heart disease and heart failure, right? That's what we were, we've been taught for the last, what, 50, 60 years? Yeah. So dive into the salt wherever you think would be the best place to start. I've read your book, and I've recommended it, like I said, 100 times. And uh, I want everybody to be listening up. If you guys know anybody who's worried about salt, if you've got a mama or a daddy who still limits their salt, and it's like, oh, my doctor told me to cut back on salt because I have high blood pressure or because I have heart failure, they need to hear this. Either watch it live or watch it on the replay. This is very, very important information. So jump in, Doc. Start wherever you want to, and let's talk sure. about salt. Yeah, I mean, so – I mean, even going above and beyond just salt, like where does our nutritional evidence even begin? Where did it yes. stem from? And it really all comes back to the 1977 Dietary Goals. And that was the launch pad for the 1980 Dietary Guidelines for All Americans. So back in 1977, that's when we got the advice to eat a low saturated fat diet, eat a low fat diet, eat a low salt diet. Now, the Cochrane Collaboration wasn't even established until 1993. So if you have any type of a dietary goals or advice coming out before 1993, 
you can pretty much guarantee it's not level A, grade A evidence. And that's basically what happened. And so the, the dietary goals told all Americans to consume just three grams of salt, which is 1.2 grams of sodium. And that's about what the American Heart Association still tells us to do, solely based on a few scientific opinions, not fact. So the main scientists that these dietary goals actually relied upon, Senator George McGovern and his committee, they relied on two scientists, uh, basically George Manili and Harold Botterby. They published a review paper the year before the goals came out, and they relied heavily on these two guys. And actually what their paper actually said was two requirements had to be met for someone to actually have a rise in blood pressure eating a normal salt diet. One, you had to be genetically susceptible. Two, you had to eat a low potassium diet. Okay, and, and if you didn't have those two requirements met, you didn't get any significant rise in blood pressure when you ate salt. Unfortunately, those, those nuances didn't translate into the dietary goals because you know what? Complicated messages don't make for good dietary guidelines. And so they needed to keep it simple. They removed those two basically important nuances and said everybody should cut their salt intake because based on literally a minority of people who actually have a benefit, when the majority of people do not see a reduction in blood pressure when they cut their salt intake. And here's the really important part. Almost everybody has a significant rise in heart rate when they cut their salt intake, which is significantly greater than the reduction in blood pressure. So right. when you combine the two, blood pressure and heart rate, almost everybody is harmed. And that's not even getting into the surrogate markers of uh, increases in triglycerides. Literally, not getting enough salt causes insulin resistance, which can lead, obviously, to diabetes. Low salt increases the stress hormones, renin, aldosterone, angiotensin II, which stiffen the arteries. Literally, low salt diets can lead to chronic hypertension. And so we fell at the feet of one surrogate marker, blood pressure, and we forgot about all the other surrogate markers that lowering salt worsens. So what about elevated heart rates versus blood, elevated blood pressure as a marker for heart disease or as a risk for heart disease? Yeah, so basically, um, when you look at the actual, what happens to, let's say, someone with normal blood pressure and they cut their salt intake, they get about a 1% reduction in blood pressure, but they actually get about a 5 to 10% increase in heart rate. So when you multiply heart rate times blood pressure, that's what's giving you the overall stress on the heart and the arteries. And when you multiply the two, it's always significantly worse on a low salt diet. So by cutting your salt, you might lower your blood pressure a, a few points, but you're going to raise your resting heart rate, which when you do the math actually turns out to be a higher risk factor for, for heart disease. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And so someone missed my sarcasm earlier. I was kidding about salt being bad for you. Salt is very good for you. And that's the whole point sure. of this discussion is that human beings crave salt for a reason. We, we, I mean, animals will walk miles to find a rock or mud that's, that's salt rich so they can lick that. They don't do that because they just love the taste of salt. They do that because sodium and, and potassium and chloride and all the other minerals found in salt are absolutely vital for your optimal health. It, they're not optional. And so when you tell somebody, in my opinion, to cut your salt intake, you might as well be telling them to cut their oxygen intake. You, you should, you're breathing too many times a day. You should stop that. That's, that makes about as much sense as telling a human being you need, to, you need to eat this minuscule amount of salt each day. It's not good for you. You should, you should get plenty of salt, and we're going to go into detail about that. Where do we go next, Doc? I'm writing down some questions as you talk. Yeah, so basically, I mean, you hit the nail right on the head. We need to start looking at salt intake as how we look at water intake. No one would ever be like, you know what, you should only consume two cups of water because drinking more is going to increase your blood pressure by 1%. People would literally right. look at you and think you're crazy. Right. And so the, literally the exact thing, same thing is happening with salt intake. Your body yep. controls your salt intake. There's something called yep. the salt thermostat. And it is not just in animals. It literally happens in humans as well. And when you don't get enough salt, the problem with that is, is the way that your body tells you to go search and seek out more salt when you're deficient in it is by hyperactivating the reward system in the brain. And unfortunately, right. sugar can hijack that when you're on a low salt diet, and so can drugs of abuse. And so literally studies in animals show if you make an animal deficient in salt, you significantly increase the risk of becoming addicted to things like cocaine, Absolutely. Adderall, and, and potentially yep. even sugar. Yeah, and somebody just asked that question, and I was going to get back to salt and addiction. When you're on a low salt diet, diet, you're actually without doubt at increased risk of developing other addictions because that's why the animals walk miles and miles to get to a salt lick 
is because they have to have salt. It's not optional. And when you look at a when you look at a basic metabolic panel or a complete metabolic panel, and you and and you look at how much what the normal range is for sodium, and the normal range is for chloride. You know, we all talk about potassium and magnesium, but when you look at how much your how much salt your body wants in your bloodstream at any given time, it's it's a it's two what two orders of magnitude more. It's a hundred you know it's over a hundred points more that your body wants sodium and chloride versus how much potassium and magnesium that it wants. And so I just I'm about to put up a YouTube video that I made at lunch today uh, quickly because I was late. But I, and so many I, it's talking about the addictiveness of junk food. And I was watching a few YouTube videos, doing some research, and so many experts in the field were like, oh, it's, it's very easy to be addicted to, to sugar and salt and fat in junk food. They all want to throw salt in. And it's completely different. It's like saying, oh, dude, you're addicted to air. Yeah, that's why you're breathing all the time. It's like, what the hell? Mm -hmm. Dude, no. You have to have air or you will die. You have to have a certain amount of salt in your bloodstream or you will die. Like, it's not optional at all. Right. And so when, it, when an expert tells you, oh, you're addicted to salt, that's, that's, that's baloney is right. what that and is. It makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah, and, and so here, just to kind of compare the two uh, between you, you have five grams of glucose throughout your entire bloodstream. You have 16 grams of sodium. And so, you know, when you compare the two, when you eat just one apple, you're getting twice the amount of glucose in that one apple than is in your entire bloodstream. When you consume a normal salt diet, that's only like one fourth of the amount of salt in your whole bloodstream. So when you look at it between which is the wrong white crystal here, it's really sugar that's driving blood pressure and all these other, you know, heart disease and things like that. It's not the other white crystal salt, which is an essential mineral. Right. It's, it's sugar and its effect on insulin that's actually creating the, 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 the fluid overload in your body that leads to elevated blood pressure in many, many people. And I'll tell you, Doc, I've had so many people that once they're on a ketogenic diet or some low carb version of that, when their blood sugars come down and their insulins come down, they diurese, get rid of all the fluid, and I have to stop one, two, or three blood pressure medicines because they don't have hypertension anymore. Once they fix their sugar addiction and get their insulin levels down, that fixes it. And, and not in everybody, but in so many people, they just don't need blood pressure medication anymore because they're running in the 130s over 70s. And that makes me very happy when I see that. And it verifies what I believe about salt, that it's not, it's not a nutrient of concern, just like the American. Stop worrying about salt and eating too much. So let's talk about amounts. How much, how much salt should we get for optimal health versus what the American Heart Association says? Yeah, so it's going to be different in everybody, just, just like with our how much water you need per day. Literally, you need to be listening to your salt thermostat and your salt cravings more than anything. That's honestly probably the best advice I can give. And so in the book, I kind of cover what all these factors that are depleting us now of salt throughout our life. You know, caffeine and coffee intake is, not, is much more uh, of a – waster of salt than than water um we lose about a half a teaspoon of salt just consuming four cups of coffee um exercise causes us to, to obviously lose salt through sweat ketogenic diets and low carb diets we diarrhea and we lose all the salt and so people who are exercising you're going to be losing anywhere from a half of a teaspoon to a full teaspoon of salt per hour of exercise so, I mean, I have dosing tables in the salt fix of how much people should be pre-dosing prior to a workout based on, you know, the ambient temperature. So it really depends on your whole lifestyle factors and disease states. But listen to your salt cravings because that's going to tell you how much you're going to need in a day. Absolutely. If you're thirsty, you should drink. If you're hypoxic, you should breathe. And if you're craving salt, you should give into that craving. Don't fight that. That's your body telling you, hey, I need this essential mineral. I need these elements in order to function properly. And so craving salt is not the same thing as craving sugar. It's not the same thing as craving processed foods. It's completely different, okay? It's, it's good to crave salt. That means you get to eat salt at your liberty. It's bad to crave cocaine because that means you've got an addiction and you go to rehab. Those are two completely different things. The, the addiction of, for, with, a, with a drug of, a, of, a, of abuse is the same as the addiction people have to processed foods and sugars. Those, they, they literally, 
light up the same parts of the brain and they tweak the same neurotransmitters. Your body can hijack that symptom, if, uh, that system, if you're low in salt and make you crave it and make you go on a search for it. You'll literally be walking miles to lick a salt lick if you don't have enough salt. You, I mean, you'll literally turn into a zombie looking for salt because you'll die without it. And that's why yeah. you're not going to die if you never eat another gram of sugar. You're not going right. to die if you never smoke crack again, but you will die if you don't have salt in your body. And so that's one craving you should give into. Yep. You know, what's interesting too is when you don't get enough salt, everybody, like everyone loves magnesium, which I'm a huge fan. I've published a lot on, um, and potassium. Everybody understands the importance of those two minerals, but what a key piece of the puzzle that a lot of people are missing is that salt literally controls your magnesium status. And because it does that, it controls your potassium and your calcium status. And what I mean by that is if you aren't getting enough salt, your body will start pulling sodium from the bone to maintain a normal level. And it will also strip magnesium and calcium from the bone at the same time. And what that actually ends up doing is the spikes in magnesium and calcium from your low salt diet tricks your body into thinking you have too much magnesium and calcium and you stop absorbing it well and you start kicking more out. The second thing that happens is to conserve sodium, your body starts sweating out more magnesium and more calcium. And the third thing is aldosterone rises and that hormone kicks out more magnesium in the urine. So literally the worst thing you can do for your magnesium status is to not get enough salt. That's a, I really want people to understand that. Yeah, that is so important, so vital. You've got to have your sodium and your, your potassium and your, your sodium and your chloride or your body's going to actually leach out and, and bleed out the magnesium trying to get the yep. sodium and chloride out of your bone to satisfy mm -hmm. your body's needs for that. That's such an important point. Tell us, doctor, what are the symptoms of somebody, if somebody does not have enough salt in their body, what are the symptoms? Sure. Most common symptoms are going to be muscle cramps, muscle spasms, exercise fatigue. And when you go from a seated to a rising position, you're going to be super dizzy. And yeah. so anyone, anyone who has what's called orthostatic hypotension when they rise from that seated to standing position and they feel lightheaded, that you do not have enough circulating blood volume. And that is a super quick sign of salt deficiency. Yep. And so fatigue, if you stand up out of a chair quickly, you get lightheaded. Those yep. are classic signs of, of low fluid status or low volume, which leads directly back to yep. low sodium and low chloride because your body uses salt. That's one of the many things that salt is, is used for in the body is to regulate fluid balance. And if you don't have enough salt, then you're going to have an improperly regulated fluid balance, which could lead to, to a low uh, fluid balance. And then you're going to be lightheaded because that's going to make you effectively hypotensive or have low blood pressure, even though you might not. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of people get confused too, because they say, well, you know what? My sodium levels are normal. So that must mean Let's I have talk a normal about salt level. Right? Very good. Let's talk about that. Yeah. And so, you know, one of the quickest ways you can check on a lab if you're salt deficient is not necessarily look at the sodium level in your blood, but to look at um, B, the BUN. If you have a normal water intake and you have a high BUN, that means you don't have good renal blood flow or kidney blood flow. Directly, that is directly caused by not having enough salt in, in blood circulation. And so one of the quick ways you can check on a lab that potentially indicates salt deficiency is an increase in blood urea nitrogen. And what about the, the BUN to creatinine ratio? Does it uh, give you the same picture or is that more just a fluid status lab? Yeah, as soon as you introduce creatinine, uh, that can kind of skew things. Right. You know, and so, so if somebody has an elevated BUN, but the creatinine is normal, then that's, that's a salt deficiency until proven otherwise. That, yeah, that's, nice. that's fair statement. Nice. I like mm -hmm. that a lot. I like that a lot. So if you guys, if you're just joining, this is Dr. James D. Nicola Antonio. He is a PhD doctor, not an MD doctor. He has multiply published in peer reviewed journals. He's published so much uh, research that it's ridiculous he, he is a nerd's nerd, and that's the, sure. ultimate, that's the ultimate compliment coming from me yep. right there. So let's see. We talked about the symptoms of salt. We talked about how important it is. We talked about how much that you need to get a day. What if somebody has heart failure? Because that, mm -hmm. that throws a, a wrench in the gears, maybe. Let's talk about that. Should somebody with the early stages of heart failure, should they limit salt? 
Okay. There's not a single study that has ever shown that lowering salt intake improves mortality and heart failure. In fact, every single study shows that it significantly increases all cause mortality. So when you have someone with heart failure, they're already on probably a thiazide diuretic like hydrochlorothiazide or chlorothalidone. They're already on a loop diuretic. You're already putting them on an ACE inhibitor, an aldosterone blocker. These are things that are basically ridding the body of, of salt. And so literally the most common symptom in heart failure patients is low sodium levels in the blood. Literally about yep. one out of four, one out of three heart failure patients have this. Yep. And so if you don't get enough salt, the problem is, is it doesn't allow the diuretic to work. The diuretic has to get into the kidneys and there has to be good blood flow to the kidneys to do that. And so when you up your salt intake, it literally improves the kidney function and allows the diuretics to do what they need to get the extra fluid out. And so what ends up happening in heart failure is you actually have an overretention of fluid compared to salt. You need to get rid of the extra fluid, not drop the sodium. And so how it works is because your heart isn't working well, the blood volume is reduced and you have reduced blood volume flowing to the kidneys. And so that actually stimulates um, what's called arginine vasopressin. So the body's holding on to extra fluid because your heart isn't able to pump the blood around the body well enough. And so that's why your, your fluid basically loaded. And so if you can up the salt intake and allow the diuretic to work better, you can get rid of the fluid and maintain a normal salt status. Perfect. I love it. And we're getting, we're getting 100 questions about everybody says they missed how much salt they should eat a day. So the, the, the recommendation from the American Heart Association is three grams a day max. Yep. <clears throat> but I recommend that you get much more salt than that. I, I think in your book you talk about that if you just leave humans to their own devices, they want to ingest, what, five to seven grams a day? Yeah, it, honestly, the normal intake is about yeah three and a half to about six grams of sodium, which is about eight to ten grams of salt per day. And you and, know how many teaspoons that would be a day, roughly? Yeah, yeah. So that'd be like one and a half to you know maybe one and three quarters teaspoons of salt is what the average person seems to be sitting, and that's where all the studies show where we have the lowest risk of death, heart disease, cardiovascular events is around that amount of salt. Um, and, and more, even more important than just how much salt, what, what types of salt should you consume? So every salt isn't yes. the same, right? Processed salt exactly. is bleached. It's got anti-caking agents. It doesn't have iodine. Even if they iodize it, it's potassium iodide, which is not the same thing as real iodine. So people, um, besides how much you should consume, I like Redmond Real Salt because it has real iodine. And great quantities, too. So we're supposed to get 150 micrograms of iodine per day. And at so least. at least. And if you're eating a sea salt, you are getting zero, zero iodine in sea salt, guys. Right. Um, so and if then can... if you're using the umbrella girl salt, it says that it's iodized, mm -hmm. but it's got the wrong kind of iodine. And I've heard from multiple authorities that a lot of the iodine sublimates out of the salt as it sits on the shelf for months and months or, or on the ship from China. And so Umbrella Girl Salt says it has iodine, but it's not any kind of iodine you can use. And probably by the time it makes it to your kitchen, most of the iodine is, has sublimated or just it went from a solid to a gas and just left the salt. And so my favorite, I was going to ask you what your favorite salt mm -hmm. is. My favorite salt is Redmond's. We like other salts for taste, but when it comes to the, the mineral profile, you can't beat Redmond's. And I, I, I've said this before, but Redmond's comes from a, an ancient sea in Utah, and it, it's buried under 30 feet of clay. And so this is the most pristine, pollutant-free salt that you could possibly find, in my opinion. I mean, yeah, you know, Himalayan potentially comes from under a mountain, but you don't know a lot about how it's processed between here and there. But Redmond's Real Salt, man, it's my favorite. I think that you you really can't do better than Redmond's Real Salt. Talk about the mineral profile and, yeah. and what you should look for in a salt besides just sodium and chloride. Yeah, so basically, so Redmond's will give you, if you if your entire daily intake of salt comes from Redmond Real Salt, you're going to get about 170 micrograms of iodine. Um, compared to if you grab a regular sea salt, you'd be lucky to get five um, micrograms of iodine. Right, right, um, right. And, and the problem with sea salt, too, is... Our oceans have 15 trillion tons of plastic, and this is getting right. into the sea salt, right? And so when you're pulling from an ancient ocean like Redmond, you're not going to have the microplastics and nanoplastics as well. And then um, it also has great amounts of calcium. You'll get about 40 milligrams of calcium, too, and it's got um, decent amounts of magnesium. Um, so, yeah, it's a high, definitely a high mineral salt. Yeah, and so everybody's asking about Himalayan 
unprocessed Himalayan salt is fine, but it's going to be low in iodine. It does have other other minerals because it's an unprocessed uh, salt from an ancient sea, but it doesn't have any iodine. And so if you're going to use Himalayan, you probably need to supplement with something like the Lugol's 2% that I talk about all the time. One or two drops of that a day is going to give you about a milligram and a half, which is way more than the minimum. But as Doc knows, if you've got normal kidney function, you can't overdose on iodine. Any extra that you take, you're just going to urinate it away. And the same yeah. goes for salt as well. And so it, you, you absolutely want a salt to taste. And, I think, and I've been doing this for years, Doc. Every time I have a, a cup of coffee, I'll put a pinch of, of Redmond's in it, right? Nice, I, and I've actually grown to like my coffee salty. But then also I know that every cup of coffee is going to make me urinate away a little bit of salt. So I'm replacing that as I go. Yeah, I started telling people to start salt in their coffee when I started putting, I published in Mind Body Green how much salt we lose when we drink coffee. Absolutely. And yeah, it kind of absolutely. started trending, you know, what, what, you know, how much salt are you putting on your coffee? And it actually does cut the bitterness of coffee. Mm -hmm. um, but another interesting point about iodine is we lose actually a tremendous amount in our sweat. So besides salt that we lose in sweat, we actually lose between 50 and 100 micrograms of iodine per hour of exercise. I mean, you can literally lose more than the recommended amount that you're supposed to ingest in a day in one to two hours of exercise and athletes they're constantly sweating out salt and iodine and they're, they're never using real salts right. to replace that iodine they're slowly becoming depleted right and there are parts of the country even back in the 20s and the teens the soil was salt was iodine depleted mm -hmm. there was just no iodine yep. and there and there's a it's like the minnesota wisconsin iowa it was called the mm -hmm. goiter belt because everybody there had a goiter or a swollen thyroid because the thyroid was having to work so hard because there wasn't enough iodine and now it really doesn't matter because you know almost nobody grows their food locally anymore more and most more and more of us are starting to do that which i think is an excellent thing but a lot of soil is just depleted in iodine it, typically the further you live from the ocean the less iodine is in the soil and so therefore the less iodine the plants have to take up and so to salt your food to taste with a good uh, sea salt that has iodine in it is vital, I think, for, for good health and longevity and increased health span, which is what we're all really after. Where do we need to go next, Doc? What do we need to talk about next when it comes to salt? Yeah, so we can talk about maybe preloading with salt before a workout and yes. you know, what, are the, what are the benefits, um, who should do it etc cetera, etc cetera. so um exercise is when you start exercising your plasma volume goes down by about 10 percent and so when you preload with salt and in water you are basically increasing your plasma volume about 10 percent so you're literally instead of that fluid going to the muscle and then being depleted in your in your circulatory system you're preventing that from happening. You got the fluid now going to the active muscle, but now you're maintaining a normal plasma volume when you're exercising. This is super vital. So how much should you do? Basically, my book lays it out in a couple nice tables, but a quick um, kind of napkin type of calculation and how I kind of think about it is if you're exercising in an 80 to 89 degree Fahrenheit temperature, about a half a teaspoon of salt with about 12 ounces of water, about a half hour before you do that. And, and honestly, it's gonna work wonders. Re regardless if you're lifting weights or running, doing you know, um, HIIT, high intensity interval training, it's gonna benefit you. Because when you're, if you're lifting weights, you still have blood flowing to the muscle. You, it's gonna help with the pump. It's gonna reduce the, um, improve your circulation so you don't have the dizziness that people get, especially when they go from like, when they're doing squats or they're doing elevated sit-ups. Um, when you, when you boost that plasma volume with salt, that doesn't happen anymore. You're not going to get the muscle spasms, the muscle cramps, and you're going to be able to work out significantly longer. And when I say significantly longer, here's what the clinical studies show. When you preload with salt and you give yourself about a teaspoon of salt and you're about to work out at about 89 degrees Fahrenheit, so fairly hot, it allows you to exercise 21 minutes longer before you become fatigued. 21 minutes longer. I don't know of a single natural substance that can allow someone to work out that much longer before becoming fatigued. And what ends up happening, how it does this, which is really cool, is the increase in plasma volume and circulation, that fluid cools your body off. So they've done core uh, body temperature studies on people who preloaded with salt. You are one degree cooler when you load yourself with salt. And so literally, 
you're cooler, your heart rate's lower, you can work out longer. I mean, what it, I mean, you can't beat salt for a pre-workout. Yeah. I don't think even steroids would give you an extra 21 minutes per workout. That's pretty amazing. And so mm -hmm. if any of you guys are getting started with your exercise regimen, Pre, pre, don't preload, don't carb up, don't, don't carb mm -hmm. load before you run or before you lift salt load. It's much yep. better. You're going to get a much better workout, a more intense workout, and you'll be able to work out longer. And for those of you who don't work out yet, you still need to eat your salt. You need the salt to taste and don't be afraid of salt. Let's wrap up about the salt doctor. And then we're going to start talking about this new book that I'm so excited about. Yeah. yeah give us a, it. give us a closing paragraph about salt wrap it up and put a bow on it all right so basically you want to eat redmond real salt a healthy salt you want to basically consume real food salt to taste trust your salt cravings and the book is called the salt fix i've recommended it a hundred times i've read it about three times i've got it on audible and so it's one of the books it's one of my go-to books when i'm like wait a minute i forgot about something and so i'll just i'll listen to a chapter again i love that book and now Let's talk about this new book. This may be backwards. I'm not sure. But let's talk about this. What's this all about? Yeah, so this is all about, you know, taking the ketogenic diet and basically upping it a notch. This is Ketogenic Diet 2.0. And so, nice. you know, I think a lot of people, you know, are doing some things right on the ketogenic diet, but they can do some things a little bit better. And so this is really, Superfuel is all about enhancing your fats, what type of fats you should be eating, how fat actually controls not just your metabolism, but how much muscle you build, um, even your performance. So that's, that's really what the book's about. I love it. I love it. And so tell us a couple of ways that we might be doing keto wrong that you're going to help us understand in the book, Super Fuel. Yep. So I think, um, you know, one of the easiest ways and when people start stalling on keto, like why am I not losing weight? I find that a lot of people are potentially adding too many fat bombs to their diet. So that would be too much heavy cream in their coffee, maybe too much butter. Are those foods bad? Absolutely not. Um, but some people are adding too much added fats. And I think if you can replace some of those added fats with maybe wild salmon or avocado, I think some people are going to see what type of benefits you can really get by just making a quick swap like that. Yeah. Yeah. Fat, fat in a little fat in your coffee is, can be very beneficial to help keep you satiated. So you're not hungry. So you're not reaching for carbs, especially if you're doing a time restricted feeding window, a little bit of fat and a little bit of salt in your coffee or your keto tea can, can be the difference between failure and success, but putting more fat is not magical. There's nothing magical about putting four tablespoons of, of Kerrygold butter in your coffee, right? And so right. back in an earlier part of my keto journey, Doc, I would do that. I would put a ton of fat. I'd put mm -hmm. a combination of different fats, and I might have needed that during that stage of my keto journey, but now... I'm almost to my ideal body weight. I'm trying to maintain. I'm trying to, you know, cut a little bit. And so I use a, a teaspoon of, of Kerrygold in my, in my coffee per, per cup, and that's it. That's all I need. And so used to, I might literally put three tablespoons of, of butter in my coffee. It's freaking delicious, no doubt about it. And if you guys are still making gains, if you're moving and making positive improvement, keep doing what you're doing. But if you stall – that's when it's time to start thinking about this new book, Super Fuel, and saying, hey, maybe I'm, maybe I, and I personally, Doc, I don't think you can eat too much fat and make yourself gain weight. At least I haven't seen that happen in clinical practice, mm -hmm. but you can sure enough slow down your weight loss or you can stall your weight loss if you're using too much fat in the way of keto coffee or in fat bombs. And so during one part of your journey, you might need those. But as you continue and as you make gains and as you try to lose even more, you're probably going to start to use the fat just as a very specific tool. If you're hungry, a little fat in the coffee. If you're not hungry, salt your coffee and move on. Yep, exactly. I love it. I love it. And so is Superfuel available now or is it pre-order? Where yeah, are we at you, on that? Yeah, you can pre-order it. It'll be available November 13th. So November 13th, and I got an advanced copy so that I can read this thing and then talk it up to the heavens because I think there's a ton of great information in this. So it's available for pre-order now on Amazon. Yep. And then absolutely, if you guys don't have a copy of the Salt Fix, what are you doing? Stop, turn this off right now and go to Amazon and buy a copy. <laughs> it's on Audible, it's on Kindle, or you can get a paperback or hardback, I think. Yep, 
Is that right? Yeah, That's absolutely. Right. All right, doctor, thank you so much. I know you've got some little ones you've got to get in the bath and get in the bed. And we yeah. really appreciate you taking the time to join us. Uh, if you wouldn't mind every day or two, if you just pop back in and scroll through and answer a question or two, my people love it when you do that. And that helps them. That helps uh, if they're wanting to, to, to connect with you. Also, somebody said that they couldn't like or follow your Facebook page. That there yeah, maybe is got, a problem. They got to go to my Dr. James Dinicola Antonio uh, Facebook page. They got to follow gotcha. me on the, doc, the doctor page. Okay, so go to that page, and we'll put a link in the show notes so that you'll know which one to go to. I'm going to put a link to Super Fuel, so you can go ahead and pre-order that. And I'm going to put another link for the thousandth time to the Salt Fix, because if you don't have that book, you need it. Yeah, and let us know. I mean, maybe we should, you know, go and do, um, you know, another interview on Super Fuel and the intricacies, what fat people should eat. If if a lot of people want to do that, we can maybe connect again on that topic. Absolutely. And so, yeah, maybe when it gets closer to going live. We could come back sure. and do a second one of these and just focus on keto 2.0, as you called it. I like that a lot yeah. because so many people have made great gains with keto and then they stall out and they're like, what the heck, man, I'm doing everything. I think I'm doing everything right. But why, why have I stalled on my weight loss or why have I stalled on whatever your health goal may be? And I think that's when it's the time comes for books like Super Fuel. And uh, I love it. The ketogenic keys to unlock the secrets of good fats, bad fats, and great health. What a subtitle. I love it. Doc, thank you so much. You guys go follow this guy. Get this guy's books. It's going to make you have better health, a better health span, and a longer lifespan. Thanks for having me, Ken. Hey, man, I'll see you soon. All right, yeah, later. All right, later. All right, guys, there you have it. If you missed any of the stuff we talked about, you know you're welcome to watch this on the replay. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. If you know any, if, if your, your brother, your sister, your next door neighbor are, is still afraid of salt, they need to see this video. You can share this on your Facebook page. You're welcome to share this in any group that you happen to be a member of on Facebook. You can send an email, you can send a text message. So many people are still afraid of salt. And that can, it's not that it's, like, oh, it's, it's sad that they're not able to use salt in their diet. No, it's actually bad for their health if they're not getting enough salt. It is a big medical deal if they're not getting enough salt. And so please share this, and thank you so much for joining me. Next time I grab a, a big, uh, fancy, famous, intelligent doctor, I'll be sure to drag him on this page and interview him so you guys can learn even more, okay? This is Dr. Barry. I'll see you next time.